Welcome back, Hordlings, to more Spellcasting 201. We're still here in class. At the Ivory Tower Auditorium. More time passes. Of course, this technique is only possible with those spells that you're very familiar with. Those spells which you use all the time and seem to live at the very tip of your tongue. If you use the eye-closing technique on spells that you don't have perfectly memorized, the effort of remembering the spell, or even the nagging uncertainty about the words of the spell, can more than neutralize the positive concentration of effects of closing your eyes. So with that in mind, let's all close our eyes and get ready to cast our most familiar and well-learned spell. Come on, everyone, don't be shy. Close those eyes. Dirty Junk Pile returns. His skin is covered by numerous red lumps. Everyone, eyes closed. Okay. Let's get ready to cast that old favorite, Bip. And you, just because your eyes are closed doesn't mean you can ignore all the tenets you've learned so far. Pronunciation, positive frame of mind, and proper follow-through. All together now, the Bip Spell! A few measures of romantic music float through the air. The din dies away as Warty Toad surveys the disheveled clothes, broken window, two bloody noses, and a herd of sheep are born of the improper spellcasting. In the silence that follows, you hear Dirty Junk Pile rapidly mumbling an experimental flying insect spell, and lo, a hornet's nest appears in the lectern. An angry swarm emerges and surrounds Warty Toad. Arms flailing, he runs out, accompanied by the term's first standing ovation. Oh, goddamn, here comes the cat. Here comes the fat cat. Always wanting attention, don't you, Lupe? Come here. Come here. Get your ass up here. <laughs> Everyone say hello to Lupe, who loves inter interrupting this LP, apparently. Don't you, Loops? Okay. All right, you can help me type, you little orange bastard. The bell rings, signifying the finish of morning class. The lecture hall quickly empties, and you stop taking notes. All right, it is uh, Sunday. I got a little bit of time before I have to work, and then tomorrow I jump on a plane at 8 a.m. and fly to Colorado, Steamboat, Colorado in particular, to hang out with the uh, quote unquote in laws. Um, yeah, it's gonna be cold as balls, but that's that's all right. Game hoarder likes some snow once in a while. Go ahead and save our game now that we're finally out of class here. Uh, I will be gone until Friday. We come back really late Friday, and then Saturday is gonna be my rest and recruit day. I doubt I get any LPing done that day. Uh, and then I go right back to work the next day after that. Then I am off Thursday, Friday, and Saturday that week to move. Um, so yeah, going to be really busy, tied up, doing that shit. And then once I finally get everything set back up, which computers will have to be set back up the following Sunday so I can get back to work after I've moved. Uh, yeah. Should start settling back in and get back on track. It's been a hectic couple weeks. All right, so class is out. We need to uh, go fulfill our requirements for our initiation as well, which was putting a mustache on the clock tower statue. Ivory Tower Lobby. From here, we can go up into the Alchemy Lab. This sprawling classroom is where generations of aspiring sorcerers have come to acquire the skill of alchemy, the ancient art of transmuting one substance into another. The lab is equipped with a panoply of mystifying equipment and is filled with rows of lab benches whose burned and pitted surfaces attest to the countless misdirected experiments. A wide set of stairs returns to the ground floor and a smaller stair leads further up the tower. In your cubby, you see a shaker of red powder, green powder, a bottle of orange fluid, a bottle of blue fluid, 
brown flaky flakes, gray flakes, and a mixing bowl. We're gonna go up again to the clock tower. For hundreds of years, the Sorcerer University clock tower has been enduring the symbol of the school. The first sign of the campus that people see as they approach, and the last thing they see as they travel away. Stooped amidst the complex mechanism that runs the clock, you feel like a mite who has crawled into a wristwatch. A rickety stair leads down and out to the clock tower. And a spindly ladder leads even further up. The clock mechanism whirs, advancing the mighty hands of the clock. Rickety ladder, let's take it. Well, you're standing on the pyramidal roof of the clock tower. The view is as stupendous as the perch is precarious. Below the ivy-clad halls of campus spread out like a picture book. Beyond the blue finger of the river stretches west amongst the hills toward the congested towers and smokestacks of Balmoral City. Looming above you at the very peak of the roof, standing at least 15 feet tall, is the venerable statue of Marvin Meltinoff, founder of SU. The only survivable exit is a flimsy ladder. Jump off tower. Jump off statue. Yeah, 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 we got you. Let's warp back down under the clock tower. Examine the gears. The mechanism is huge and complex. As you stare at its seemingly infinite number of moving parts, something catches your eye. A spell box tucked deep in the mechanism. The clock mechanism whirs, advancing the mighty hands of the clock. Uh, does that mean we can't? We're advancing. Oh, yeah, it's 11.50. So the one time we can grab this is when uh, the clock is about to hit the hour. You can't quite get a grip on it. The big bonger that rings the chimes is right in front of it. Blocking the way. The clock mechanism whirs, advancing. Okay, can I get to it now? Yes, now I can get to it. A finger of energy leaps from the spell box to the spell book, dazzling your eyes. When your vision returns to normal, you see that the spell box has vanished. All right. That was the... Uh... Fogwaka spell. Spell of dehumidification. And it is noon ten. Okay. Back to the statue. Now that statue has oil on it, so if you try to climb it, you cannot. Bip front piscus. Not sure I have the spell I need, actually. Oh yes, I forgot. I have to go get the wish spell. We got the diamond. Okay, so from 
Here we need to get over to the Student Union Center. So we'll go south and east. And we want to get into the janitor closet here where you can see a glass case. The whoosh spell. There she is. Now we'll go ahead and save because there is only one way in this glass box, I believe, but we can try some stuff. <laughs> Oddly, your hand bounces resoundingly off the surface of the glass, providing a great opportunity for a neat sound effect. Um, I really don't have any other weapons, per se. Smash glass with trophy. <laughs> and it's just going to keep giving us those sound effects. Examine room. This is a small room with an exit. A small shelf for holding and cleaning supplies is attached to the wall. Mounted on the wall below the shelf is a glass case. Read book. Read how to book. Read how hyphen to book. Taking the how-to book first. No, your brain cells quiver with the boredom even at the idea of reading this nominally boring tome again. Fortunately, you've retained everything, so there's really no need to read it again. The how-to book. Uh, take bucket. Perhaps you'd be rather attending Jenna to you. Yeah, we've been down that road. All right, so as far as I know, there's only one way to get to the whoosh spell, and that's using the diamond on the glass. Um, cut the glass to a diamond. Got a spell right, too. The diamond easily slices through the glass, creating a large opening in the case. Open box. All right, new spell. Open spell book. You have the whoosh, which removes tough oils. Hint, hint. So the university was I'm getting kicked out because of the damn class. Son of a bitch. So now we gotta wait for that class to end. I probably have another class going on during this. see where this was. Maybe I could go even faster. If this is still in class, that is. Of course, this might prevent me from getting the other box.
<sighs> now we gotta come back and get this box later. What a pain in the ass. Big bonger that rings the chimes. Maybe it has to be exact five minutes after the hour. I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, let's cast whoosh. The statue is no longer glistening, and now you can see we can go up again. With an agility that would make your physical skill instructor proud, you pull, shimmy, scramble, and claw your way up the statue until you find yourself clinging desperately to the neck of the statue, trying to ignore the vertinigatus plunges on all sides. I haven't used vertiginous in quite a while. Like, ever. All right, so we are at the top of the statue. Smack the mustache onto the upper lip of the statue. A bit lopsided, but it'll do. You get 20 fucking points. Distantly a bell ring signifying the start of early afternoon class. A trouncy nip. Trouncy nip. Is suddenly fluttering in the air in front of your face. All records show that you're supposed to be in class right now. It's very important to attend all your classes, you know. After giving you a playful kick in the shoulder, the nip disappears. kick-ass music. As you've been climbing down, you lose your grip and only a quick hook of your leg around the statue's arm prevents a fatal plunge. Your movement causes a piece of the statue to break loose, namely the sheet metal bender which Melting Wolf was shown holding, and the dislodged piece falls through the opening into the clock tower below, landing with the smash. You wind up hanging upside down by one leg with the ground swinging disorientally above. With your heart racing like mad and with your mouth gibbering hysterical, Little streaks. Graduation nymph appears, wearing a tiny cap and gown. Congratulations, you've graduated to rank three sorcerer. It's obviously inconvenient right now, but at your first opportunity, you should attend an address by some self-important windbag who is trying to be profound, but is merely spouting cliches. Okay, promise? Good. Also, once you have an office, you'll want to right away to Sorcerer Central HQ for a suitably framed certificate. The nymph vanishes. Got little tidbits of congratulatory music. And I just need to figure out where the hell my class is, because I'm obviously a bit late. All right, we're certainly going to be late for class. In Donkey Dung Hall, you see Gary Dirty Junk Pile and Sid Dances with Sheeps. Seeing that the class is in session, you start taking notes. Left mice, spatula mast, forms the basis of all internally taken potions, which augment physical skills. For instance, a simple mixture of spatula moss and squirrel vomit forms your basic speed enhancement potion. The second of the five fig leaf plants is damnation moss. This moist earthbound moss is re easily recognized because of its streaks of red and horn-shaped projections at the end of its tiny leaves. Damnation moss is the 
primary component of all magical healing salves, as well as the component in many internally taken medicines. One caution, about 2% of all people are allergic to Domination Moss and will react violently to the consumption of any potion containing it. The magical properties of Damnation Moss have been known since prehistoric times. Archaeologists have found traces of it among the remains of the huts of ancient medicine men, indicating that even these primitives knew of its restorative powers. Thirdly, we come to the simple berry shrub. This beautifully flowering evergreen shrub gets its name from a foolish old tale that eating its berries would turn a person into a simpleton. This persistent myth has been exhaustively proven to be untrue. The simple berry has no magical properties whatsoever. Although the simple berry is not magical, the shrub itself is, certainly is. Give a simple berry shrub a vigorous shake and you'll be surrounded by a cloud of quite potent pollen. Inhaled, this pollen gives reasonably effective stealth abilities. When collected, this pollen can be mixed with a variety of enhancers and modifiers to produce the simple berry family of invisibility potions. A century and a half of research has yet to uncover a more effective and longer lasting group of invisibility potions. Fourth of the fig leaf plants is the dwarf gecko pine, a narrow leaf evergreen which grows only in the foothills to the west of Port Gecko. To produce stasis potions and other potions of immobilization and preservation, the gecko pine is ground up, trunk, branches, leaves, cones and all, and heated for an extended period in a sealed glass container, a process known as bosbotification. In addition to making stasis type potions possible, the dwarf gecko pine produces a magical sap which is a key ingredient in several important alchemical compounds. Finally, there's a broadleaf deciduous tree known as the Southern Red Dragonwood, or more commonly, the Lugnut Tree. Hmm? Lugnut Tree? It is the Lugnuts themselves which carry magical essences, however they are difficult to come by, since their three only produces nuts after an extended monsoon season. And the nuts usually remain on a tree for a day or less. Lug nuts are sun-dried, finely chopped, and mixed with various dead insects to create animal transformation powders. For example, lug nuts and lice are the basis for the standard human-to-bird powders. I see the time is just about up. For Wednesday, please read the first two chapters in Dill Pickle's book. The bell rings signifying the finish. You stop taking notes. Now, you don't have long to get to your later afternoon class, which is a required class because you need items from that class but I do want to see now remember the sheet metal bender broke through the clock tower and it looks like it's chilling out here Now we have the sheet metal bender of Balmora, which gives us another 20 points. A bell rings signifying the start of the late afternoon class. The lab quickly fills with students and you start taking notes. So we're here in our alchemy class just in time. Gonna take everything but the bowl. So we got a red powder, green powder, orange fluid, blue fluid, and brown flakes and gray flakes, and we're shit, we're holding too much. Okay, you would be alchemist. Let's not waste any more time. Let's start learning the stuff. This is our the Professor glances down in his notes. Alchemy 302 Concepts of Transmutation, and I'm Professor Hidden Muller. Now we'll drop the red powder. Before we get into our first lesson, let me set down some ground rules. If you miss class, you're out. If you're late with an assignment, you're out. If you give me any guff, you're out. If I don't like your face, you're out. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yep. Alright, let's take the gray flakes. Okay, 
Hidden Muller looks down at its thick syllabus and begins reading. Lesson 1. Introduction to basic alchemistic supplies. He looks up. Everybody should be fully equipped cubby. Yes, and I've taken it all and fully equipped my pockets. One student timidly says, Professor, my cubby is empty. Well, just bother the stuff, bother stuff from someone else, you whiny little turd. You pop open the shaker of green powder. Hidden Muller continues reading. Basic components of any transmutation are the essence of weakening compounds. You should have a stoppered bottle of our flask containing an orange fluid. This is essence weakening compound number one, also known as EWC1. You pop open the bottle of orange fluid. EWC1 is a time tested combination of mass sweat, hell hamster blood, and sap from a dwarf's cock. I mean Dwarf Gecko Pine, sorry. I was up late last night. You pop open the bottle of blue fluid. Your other bottle of flask has a blue fluid. This is S&E Weekend Compound number two. You pop open the pouch of Grey Flakes. EWC2, first formulated in night 17 by Professor Gerard Sizzling Ray Soup. Here at Sorcerer U contains fig juice, the tears of a newborn baby, and the elephant mating essence. I've never seen elephant spelled this way, but that's okay. Continue on. The professor looks up at the student sitting nearby. How'd you like to drink with that with your dinner, gnarly bush? You pop open the pouch of brown flakes. Hidden Mola res resumes reading. AWC fluids are the first step in any transmutation. By weakening the essence of what makes a substance that substance, it prepares it for the modifications to follow. Some basic transmutations require EWC1. He flips through the syllabus. EWC2 and some will use both fluids. And more advanced transmutations require more complex EWC compounds. We'll deal with them briefly later in the term in more fully in Alchemy 401. Game that spellcasting 401 never came to be. Oh, sorry about that. All right. Had a little cut, had to pause the camera and get back to class. Uh, the bottles containing EWC and 2, as well as containers that hold your other alchemy supplies, are the latest in magic technology. They are designed to dispense exactly one unit of substance each time you pour. In addition, the containers are auto-refueling, so you'll never run out of any supply. Neil Cubby, you find the shaker of green powder. This is positive matter transmuting compound, MTC+. Composed of sunflower pollen, dehydrated jungle moss, and ground freeze dried puffer slug. Hidden Molar looks up and raises his eyebrows as his eyes fix on yours. Well, Eagle Beak, not exactly the stuff you'd like to find in yonder pants, is it? <laughs> I didn't realize I had a sophomore in this class. Don't think I'm going to go easy on you just because you're taking a junior level course. In fact, I'll probably go harder on you. Let's see, where was I? You also have a shaker of red power, which is negative matter transmuting compound MTC minus. It's a mixture of sea salt, dried banana seeds, and powdered Bovtonian coral. It was first developed by the great mage Lewis Setting Sun in 858. It's what actually drives the transmutation, with MTC plus pushing your substances into a higher order element, and MTC minus pulling it down into a lower substance. Now look for the pouch of gray flakes. This bag contains transmutatorial accelerator. Also counts transolerator. These flakes are made from sycamore bark, grated scallop shell, and dandruff from a dying witch. Transolerator speeds up duration of common transmutations. Changes which could take hours or even days without these flakes occur in mere minutes. <laughs> I wish I could get some flakes that would have the same effect on my laundry woman. As Hidden Muller chuckles, a small key slips from his pocket and falls to the floor unnoticed. 
You take the small key. Your other bag should be a pouch of brown flakes. These flakes are transmutatorial dampener, usually referred to as Transtop. It's produced from chopped onion skin, polarized dragon scales, and scrapings from a briefcase of a dead lawyer. Transtop causes the transmutation to halt before it can progress onto an undesired additional changes. It removes all traces of EWC and MTC compounds and then quickly disperses as well. Congratulations! You're now ready to attempt your first simple transmutation. Instructor passes out the pieces of iron. Oh, I guess I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> Hidden Muller passes around a box containing lumps of metal. You take your lumps. You're going to try the assignment, Eagle Beak, laughs Hidden Muller. Try not to blow the roof off the building. <laughs> You put a lump of iron in the mixing bowl. Your first lab assignment will be to turn this specimen of iron into copper. This most basic transmutation, first performed in 841, is known as the turtle shell transmutation. After the pioneering alchemist Tyrone Turtleshell, get ready to copy down the formula. Put your iron in your mixing bowl and pour in one unit of EWC1, then add two units of MTC+, plus, then add one unit of Transurator. Wait ten minutes. Finally, add one unit of Transstop. You should now have a piece of copper in your mixing bowl. Hidden Molar looks up with a grin, but knowing what a bunch of incompetence you sorcerer wannabes are, more likely you'll have a bowl full of mess. If so, just lug it over to the cafeteria and they'll serve it for lunch. <laughs> so fucking funny. All right, folks, that wraps it up for this episode. We'll stay tuned for more Spellcasting 201.